Hello everybody and welcome back. Now in today's video, we are talking about the practices of war and the impacts of their outcome, technological developments, naval. So just as a reminder that the practices of war is how it's fought and development refers to a new idea or the refining of a product. Now naval. Naval refers to warfare that is fought on the sea or under the sea with the use of massive battle cruisers, battleships, which are called dreadnoughts and submarines. We're gonna, our first example is going to be the dreadnought, so don't worry about having that focused in right now. But what makes sea warfare so important in World War I is the fact that this is still a war of empires and colonies. So the British Army, for instance, and the British Navy is separated all across the world in India, Hong Kong, uh, Africa, Europe, and in the Americas with Canada. So the British Navy is spread out to the seven continents of the world. And if another country dominated the sea, they would effectively separate large parts of the British Empire. So naval warfare is significant in World War I because of that reason. These empires aren't all together in one nation. They are spread. And the best way to transport them at this time was either by railroad or by boat. So what is the dreadnought? Well, the dreadnought is the premier style of a boat during this time. A dreadnought was a type of battle cruiser that was heavily armed. Um, and have, and just this super thick machines. They were massive, massive boats. In fact, the name in and of itself refers to the point of them. Dread not. When you separate that, dread means fear. Not is an old English way of saying nothing. So these dread knots are supposed to be large enough, big enough, and have as much weaponry on it to fear nothing. And that was exactly the case. These things were massive mobile fortresses that carried unbelievably amounts of soldiers, ammunition, weaponry, armor that they could essentially move with little to no resistance. Now, they're not perfect. As we're going to see towards the end, there's going to be some pretty clear flaws with the dreadnought. But let's analyze these for a little bit. So as you can see on the screen, uh, this is a Russian style dreadnought. This Russian straw dreadnought is huge. It has one, two, three, four, ten, three inch um, artillery guns, which means the barrel is three inches, which is about, well, let's say about that big, give or take, that are firing massive shells. On top of that three inch, they also have three six inch, which is about that big in terms of artillery unit uh, that are just opening fire on boats, cruisers, ships, um, on land, as you're going to see. And unless there is something in the water to stop them or a bomber in the air, they are untouchable. They are completely out of reach. So they can just hang out just off the coast and start sending weapons. So much so, this battle cruiser specifically has two 12 inch in diameter uh, artillery units, which is about the size of my head, actually bigger than the size of my head, uh, that are sending munitions that are that huge, that are sending them as far as they possibly can go. So these things were meant to f uh, dominate the sea and prevent anything from moving back and forwards in terms of supplies, troop transport, or other enemy boats. Now, as we talked about as a causes to the to the First World War, Germany started putting a lot of money into their dreadnoughts. They also started putting money into a new technology and refining that technology to make it unbelievably successful. Now, the 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 three biggest weaknesses with the dreadnought is anything below a certain point was weak underneath the water it, it wasn't as thick 
in terms of armor because if it was too thick there was less uh air chambers which is how these boats are usually um kept afloat that there's less space in the air chamber so they couldn't stay afloat as much as possible and because of that thinness a perfectly timed explosive anywhere along this bottom would expose it and cause it to sink from within now that also means that if they put uh, sea mines as we're going to talk about in the next slide and these boats hit them enough of them will eventually penetrate the sides um, if they're not careful and then once we get to submarines they're able to send much larger explosives under the water to hit that target if these ships didn't see them first now let's look at a, a, a battle where dreadnoughts were used both unsuccessfully and successfully so this battle is called the gallipoli campaign it takes place on the dardanelles which is just off the coast of, of turkey um, with the british versus the turkish now the british specifically used their colony the australians and the new zealanders in this battle it took place between february 1915 to january 1916. the goal was to open up a new front so that if they hit the the ottomans very hard they can open up a part to make it easier for russia to move back and forward so this is the idea but the way they're going to approach this is to do a naval bombardment that they're going to move their battle cruisers along the coast just so far enough away from artillery units and just start sending as much explosives as they possibly can so that's the idea uh pretty simple pretty straightforward hey they're in dreadnoughts they don't fear anything well they didn't send enough or didn't catch as many uh mines sea mines as there was present in the water so as these battle as these dreadnoughts are moving through they are hitting sea mines left and right just blowing blowing and blowing and eventually blowing holes into these ships starting to sink them and so a lot of these soldiers had to either get to a lifeboat to go to another battle cruiser and potentially hit a sea mine or get in a rescue boat and head straight for the shore into enemy gunfire and sea mines and uh not guarantee that they have their own weaponry with them so that was the idea and when the battle cruisers went through when the dreadnoughts went through a lot of them sank and it was it started off as a failure the the dreadnoughts were not able to get to the position that they needed to in order to successfully uh bombard this region but eventually they they regroup they repair some of their dreadnoughts that they were able to survive turn them around and send them back at which point they do uh, an amphibious assault which is what you see on the screen here where the uh dreadnoughts fire as many uh artillery shells and explosives onto the shoreline they do this as a way to scramble the enemy and as they do that they're going to send the australian and new zealand forces also known as the anzacs a-n-z-a-c straight to the shore and uh so they successfully make it the problem being no one was prepared for this region except for the turkish people and so even though this this doesn't last the full year the uh anzac forces suffer heavy heavy casualties and eventually have to be evacuated back on dreadnoughts so it's successful when you make sure your environment is safe enough for these ships to move so that's the one thing the dreadnoughts have to fear the second thing the dreadnoughts have to fear was a german invention now this invention was a improvement on what already existed called the unterseebooten the u-boat unterseebooten essentially translates to under the sea boat um it pretty self-explanatory now the reason why these things were so dangerous is because they were able to finally perfect the ability to be under the water completely where they didn't need a steady air supply um because they were able to use oxygen tanks and and other technologies so now 
these boats could successfully hide underneath the water. And when they did, they then created a new threat, a hidden threat, one you could not tell. Because radar and sonar and all the things we think about now when we think of submarines, none of that technology existed. It was just eyes, eyes and hearing, nothing else. So these boot, these U-boats caused a significant threat because now they could fire explosives that were much stronger than a mine and they could follow these boats and they can sink these boats. And, you know, we, we hear about this a lot with like the sinking of the Lusitania or uh, the sinking of other ships. But what makes the U-boats more threatening or a bigger threat is the Germans use them in a style of strategy called wolf packs. What this wolf pack was is that they would take three or four uh, U-boats, keep them all together relatively in a, in a little formation, and they would just travel up and down the coast finding and looking for these boats. And they could come in, blow them up really quick, these dreadnoughts, go back under the water and run away. It was incredibly scary and incredibly successful. So these U-boats were the great counter to the dreadnoughts, but unlike the dreadnoughts, uh, these U-boats had a huge weakness. Oxygen, air, they had to surface, they had to do things, they couldn't stay hidden the whole time. So once they were able to, the allies and the, and the Triple Entente were able to find ways to track these, to find signs to see these, they were handled with. Now, the last way that naval technology was effective in World War I was plain and simply um, <clears throat> the use of blockades. That when we think of World War I, the thing we need to think about the most is that as, as long as these boats could keep people away from the land, then they might stand a chance to defeat the enemy. Whether it's the British, whether it's the French, whether it's the Germans, whether it's the Russians, it doesn't matter. Because of how much World War I was almost was fought on land, how dependent it was there, that if you could, could, could control the transportation between these regions, then you could control the land. Conversely, just like with air, if you can control the air, you could theoretically control the land. But both of these, naval and air technology, was brand new. Land warfare was new, but also faster to catch up. And as we're going to see, once we get later on to the line in our second example of World War II, these examples are going to come back up, but in very different ways for the lessons that are learned here on how to improve it. That despite the fact that you can use blockades, you can still get supplies in other ways. Despite the fact that you have all these planes, you create anti-aircraft cannons. The fact that with gas, you can use masks, and it's just the same strategy of countering of technology. But in World War I, the thing that is the same is most of the strategy is exactly the same. That when technology advances, strategy doesn't. And so because of that, air and naval technology don't really see much of a highlight or don't see as much as an exploration as you do with land technology.